Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Looks like things didn't quite work out for El Duce. I wonder what happened. Well, let's go back to 1942. Mussolini's dream of rebuilding the Roman Empire was starting to come together, with a little help from Rommel, of course. But in the immortal words of Biggie Smalls, it was all a dream. The British knew that losing Egypt meant losing the Suez Canal, cutting them off from India, the crown jewel of the British Empire. However, finding a general that could beat Rommel was easier said than done. Okay, let's review all the generals we've tried. This guy got himself captured by driving the wrong way. Lacks imagination. Reportedly a bit of a bedwetter. Too fond of birds, whatever that means. Way too slow. Why do all these guys suck so bad? Who else do we have? Wait, who's this? Montgomery, eh? Looks wiry. Put him in. At this time, Hitler's focus was on Russia, so resupplies to Africa had dried up like a popcorn fart in the desert. But despite lack of support, Rommel was holding his own, until it all went down in the inconsequential town of El Alamein. Montgomery outfoxed the Desert Fox, pushing him all the way back to Tunisia. Churchill states, before El Alamein, we never had a victory. After El Alamein, we never had a defeat. To make matters worse for Rommel, American and British forces start to land in West Africa held by VC France. At Casablanca, the French fleet engages with the Americans, but the French admiral is a bit of an opportunist. He can see the Nazis are on their way out, so he negotiates a ceasefire with the Allies, even though he had no authority to do so. This made Hitler madder than a box of frogs, with the frogs he had in a box. He occupies the rest of France, ending any pretenses of an independent VC France. The Americans are finally here, and they brought everything. And I mean everything. Food, ammo, railway engines, industrial tools, several kitchen sinks, and much, much more. They even bring six tons of lingerie, for bartering purposes. The Americans don't solve problems, they overwhelm them. But the Americans are noobs, with no combat experience. Roosevelt figured North Africa would be the ideal place for them to build up XP. But Rommel, who is max level, is griefing them at every turn. The Americans pull back to Kasserina Pass so they don't get ganked. All of a sudden, Patton comes in with his fast mount and the Sword of a Thousand Truths, yelling, Opens up a can of whoop ass, sending Rommel back to his spawn point in Germany. The Americans have leveled up. New areas have been unlocked. The battle for North Africa is over, but the war for the world has just begun. <laughs> Hitler's North Atlantic Wall is a system of well-fortified defenses stretching from Scandinavia to Spain, acting like a big keep-off-the-lawn sign. But Canadians live in igloos year-round and have no idea what a lawn is. So they volunteer to make a small amphibious raid on Dieppe. The raid is comprised of about 6,000 men, mostly Canadians, with 50 U.S. Rangers and 1,000 British commandos. The objective was to land on German-occupied France, briefly hold the port, and then go home. Easy peasy. Well, not really. The results were disastrous. The planning was terrible. Whatever could go wrong, went wrong. There was no initial bombardment to soften up defensive positions. Tanks got stuck in soft sand and the men who did make it ashore got pinned down or wiped out. This becomes one of the most tragic days in Canadian military history. On the bright side, there was one success by a pigeon named Beachcomber, who carried a note alerting commanders that the raid had started when all other communications had failed. Beachcomber received a Dickens Medal, an honor given to animals during wartime. The raid on Dieppe had made one thing clear. It's going to take a lot more planning to breach Hitler's Atlantic Wall. More planning and a lot more pigeons. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, Stalin was still up to his eyeballs and Nazis and demanding a second front be opened. So the Allies invade Sicily. And that went pretty well. At this point, the Italian people see the writing on the aqueducts. They place Mussolini under arrest and enter into secret negotiations with the Allies to surrender. The initial invasion of Italy was very intense. Then, the negotiated surrender kicked in. Maybe Churchill was right. Italy was the soft underbelly of Europe. Then Hitler shows up and was like, up, 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 up. not so fast. He had anticipated Italy dropping the ball. So he deployed 16 divisions to stiffen Italy's defense. Hitler then reinstated El Duce. This time he fully inserted his hand up Mussolini's ass and made him his puppet. What do you think, Mussolini? Are we going to win? Oh, Hitler, you're so smart. Of course we're going to win. The advance up the Italian peninsula becomes a slow, bloody grind that lasts almost two years. Turns out, the underbelly wasn't so soft after all. Hitler knew the Allies were planning to invade somewhere along the coast of France. But where? German intelligence had picked up radio chatter indicating that the Allied invasion of France would be landing near the city of Calais. Air reconnaissance confirmed troop and equipment buildup near Dover. 
It was publicly announced that Patton would be in command of the invasion force. Aha, Germany knew the Allies' next move. However, this was all part of a deception plan named Operation Fortitude. Every effort was made to trick the Germans into believing that this would be the real D-Day army. What are they doing now? Uh, they don't seem to be doing much except whipping around in the wind. Dwight Eisenhower is named Supreme Allied Commander, which has got to be the coolest job title I've ever... Uh, oh. Operation Overlord, a.k.a. D-Day. Uh, the D stands for day, by the way, so when we say D-Day, we're actually saying day-day. Anyways. On the night of June 5th, Allied bombers dropped thousands of bombs to soften up the defenses. Further inland, hundreds of planes carrying paratroopers start to take heavy fire, causing the men to bail out into the darkness, scattering all over the map. No one is where they are supposed to be, yet somehow in the chaos, these paratroopers band together to capture key bridges and complete objectives. As day breaks, a wall of 6,000 ships makes its way across the English Channel. The beaches of Normandy have been divided into five objectives. The British will capture Sword and Gold. The Canadians will take Juno. The Americans have Utah and Omaha. Omaha experiences the heaviest enemy resistance that day. One company takes over 92% casualties. The fighting was difficult, but by the end of the day, they had achieved a foothold. The days that follow aren't any easier. Dealing with constant German counterattacks as they try to make their way through minefields and hedgerows. Hedgerows are like walls of bushes that mark property lines. At the base, they have drainage ditches that act like a trench system. There's hundreds of these enclosures, each acting like a fortress. It took over six weeks to get through this garden of nightmares. As allies push forward, resupply becomes a major issue. You need to capture cities with major ports in order to get those bullets and beans to the troops. No problem, we'll just get the engineers to build a port. But Mother Nature's a bitch, and the storm immediately destroys it. The original plan for the invasion of France was supposed to be two-pronged. Operation Overlord was originally called Sledgehammer, and in the south, the invasion was Anvil. The combined operation would have been known as Hitler's Balls Go Smashy Smashy. But the name was kind of long and they didn't have enough landing craft to accommodate both attacks, so the southern attack was abandoned. As resupply became the major bottleneck, the attack on southern France was reconsidered. Most of the good German units had been moved north to counter the D-Day invasion, so the resistance was relatively light. With the second front coming from the south, Hitler does what his father should have done many, many years ago, and pulls out. The German armies move back to the well-prepared Siegfried line to show this wolf still has teeth. The walls are closing in, but Hitler's grit remains absolute. The only way to stop this insanity is to kill Hitler, which was attempted 42 times. This guy has more lives than four and a half cats. The most famous assassination attempt was the July plot. This is when Cyclops Tom Cruise set off a bomb near Hitler, but the blast was absorbed by a heavy desk and the plot failed. And as you can imagine, Hitler was quite upset. It was discovered that conspirators had planned to name Rommel as the new head of state. Even though he had nothing to do with it, Hitler gave Rommel two choices, take a poison pill or be publicly executed. To move supplies across France, the Allies created a convoy of trucks called the Red Ball Express. Named after the red dots that marked the way, it was a slow and painful way to deliver loads to the front. Unlike the Blue Ball rocket, which often delivered its loads too early. The Allies need deep water ports to speed up the resupply process, but Hitler isn't as dumb as he looks and he makes it a priority to defend all the port cities. Montgomery suggests a bold operation, to use paratroopers to capture seven key bridges. Then ground forces could use these roads to punch deep into German territory, effectively cutting Germans off from the coast and securing access to ports. Eisenhower approves Market Garden, the largest airborne operation in history. Over 34,000 paratroopers jump into the Netherlands. However, the bridge objectives were so deep and the resistance so heavy, the airborne had to withdraw before the main forces could reach them. The whole thing was a bust. You could say this operation went too far. A bridge too far. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! In retaliation to Market Garden, Hitler floods parts of the Netherlands, deliberately cutting food off to civilians. Thousands starve to death. Two Canadian divisions fight through miles of wetland and liberate the Netherlands. Canada had also given refuge to the Dutch royal family during the war. To this day, they continue to show their appreciation by sending thousands of tulips to Canada each year. How is Hitler handling all this stress, you ask? Well, mentioning the possibility of being defeated is a crime in Germany at this time. And his daily shots of cocaine, opiates, bull sperm have made him quite erratic. Okay, guys, bring it in. Not looking great out there. We need to put a W on the board. Here's the plan. Remember what we did in 1940? Sure, Blitzkrieg through the Ardennes. Good times, good times. Exactly. We'll do that again. Blitzkrieg. Ayo. Hey um, problemo, sir. We're running out of men. 
No problem. We pull from the Eastern Front. What about what about the Russians? You're fired. Sir, we no longer have air superiority. We don't need it if it's cloudy. What happens when it clears up? Fired. This is Hitler's big comeback, and Germany throws all its resources into this offensive. Catching the Allies off guard, they pull back, causing a bulge in the line. The 101st Airborne Division digs in and gets encircled near the town of Bastogne. Even in freezing winter conditions and completely surrounded, the Germans are unable to dislodge them. So they send the Americans a letter demanding their surrender. Commanding Officer McAuliffe returns a one-word reply. Nuts. What is nuts? These nuts. Eventually, Patton arrives and was able to slap the Germans back like PTSD out of a soldier. Hitler is now completely out of steam, but in reality, the beginning of the end was right after Stalingrad. Even with the dwindling resources, Hitler had compelled his commanders to continue advancing on the Eastern Front. Like the salient at Kirk, it was a textbook spot to conduct a pincer maneuver. The battle starts with both sides trading artillery and massive dogfights in the sky, a lot of back and forth. This battle will be remembered as the largest tank battle in history. The Germans use superior tactics and are able to flick double casualties, but still they could not punch through the well-prepared Russian defense. See, not only had Russia been warned about this attack months ago by British intelligence, the defense was also led by General Zhukov. Zhukov was the most decorated officer in the history of the Soviet Union, and he is often regarded as the best allied general of the war, bar none. With this advance warning, he had time to turn Kirks into an impenetrable fortress. By 1944, long gone were the days of sharing rifles and strapping mines to dogs. The Russians now have excellent equipment and are well led. They become a war machine that pushes the Germans back on all fronts. We now go to Fritz, live on the scene. He is with 60,000 Wehrmacht, and they have been trapped in what is being called the Corson Pocket. Hail Hitler. Hi, hi, uh, hail Hitler. How are things going? Well, we've been cut off and surrounded for a few days, but today is the day we are finally breaking out. As you can see, everybody's quite happy to finally be safe. Oh, oh, there seems to be some sort of Soviet tanks appearing in the distance. And they seem to be accompanied with cavalry as well. Uh, this, this does not look good. Ah! Fritz, Fritz, are you okay? Can you tell us what is happening out there? Okay, there you have it, folks. Live from the Corson Chesky Pocket. Things are not looking great. Hans, how's that weekend weather looking? Russian tanks and cavalry run down the fleeing Germans for the next four hours. In the end, 30,000 Germans lay dead in the snow after the most macabre Benny Hill chase scene ever. Stalin was asked to coordinate a major offensive on the Eastern Front to support the June 6 Normandy invasion. Stalin being Stalin decides on June 22nd instead. This marks the third anniversary of Barbarossa. To Stalin, a sense of humor is like food. Not everybody has to get it, as long as he does. The Soviets employed deep battle tactics to great success, more or less completely pushing Germany out of Russia. Over the last five years, Poland has been stuck between a rock and a hard place, suffering under German and Russian occupation. As sounds of fighting get closer to Warsaw, the Poles realize the only hope is to liberate themselves. Under-equipped and with no support, they rise up for their freedom. But Nazis being Nazis, they use women and children as human shields and quell the rebellion. The reprisals are brutal. 85% of the city is systematically leveled. By the end, over 200,000 Poles are murdered. Possibly the single worst massacre of the war next to Nanjing. As you can imagine, the Russians are pissed. With revenge in their hearts, they murder and rape indiscriminately. Word of this gets back to Allied command, and they demand that Stalin put an end to these atrocities. To his credit, he pumps the brakes on this brutality. The Americans and British aren't without their atrocities. The bombing of Dresden was an unbridled revenge for London by the RAF. When pictures get released to the public, there's an outcry, asking the question, when you do evil to fight evil, does evil just become the norm? On April 30th, Hitler goes through the morning paper. All that is left of Germany's army is old men and boys as young as 13. Hitler learns that Mussolini is captured by Italian partisans trying to escape the country. Fonito Mussolini. <laughs> uh, well, it was a good run. On May 7th, the Nazis signed an unconditional surrender. The next day is celebrated as VE Day, victory in Europe. Two Axis powers down, one to go. <laughs> Oh, my God.